Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for joining us again. Sheikh Nuruddin, Sheikh Jamili. We will start off um, with some questions that we've got in the chat, and then we also have some questions from social media, which we'll try to tackle, inshallah. Uh, I'd just like to remind the viewers that if they want to join, they can join us in studio. The link is in the uh, chat, and also I'll put it into the description. Um, so we'll uh, also, if, if you don't want to join us live, you can leave your um, question in the comment, and we'll go through it, inshallah. Okay, Sheikh, uh, the first question, the... Um, the person hasn't really stated who to, but maybe both of you can comment briefly. Um, first question is that in Saudi, a lady has been offered a job at a female-only school. The employer says she can't wear a hijab. 99% of the students are Muslim and some employees are not Muslim. Does any valid opinion allow this? Yeah, subhanAllah, very strange. Um you know, why would you say she can't wear hijab? Even in non-Muslim countries, they, well, some they do obviously restrict their hijab, but generally speaking, they don't restrict their hijab. It's very strange. But the point is, if it was Muslim women only, then from the Hanafi perspective, there's no obligation for her to wear the hijab, so it's up to her. Um, since some of them are non-Muslim, and also there are employees that are, non-Muslim, I'm guessing they're all females, but in the, in the Hanafi Madhab, we do say that the aura of a Muslim woman in front of non-Muslim women is essentially full aura, is the same as her aura in front of non-Mahram men. So from the Hanafi perspective, if there are non-Muslim women there, she would have to cover the entirety of her body except for her face, her hands, and then the feet are differed over. Nam Sayyidi. Okay, uh, in the Shafi'i Madhab, uh, the aura, meaning the parts that she has to cover for a Muslim lady in front of non-Muslim women, and uh, this also applies also to um, women that, even Muslim women that may not be trusted uh, in their presence, trusted being they may... Um, they may talk about someone, they may talk about that Muslim lady in front of others, or they, they're not what we call trustworthy to be around. Um, uh, or so the, the aura of that woman is everything, uh, basically from her, the only place she's allowed to reveal is her neck and her hat thing from her fingers to her elbows and from her toes to her shin, uh, to her knee, sorry. So that's the only places that could be revealed. Everything else that is not a, 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 that is not a part of what I've mentioned is considered as aura, which means that the woman must cover those areas, which includes the head. Uh, so here with the sheriff, it's called this would be problematic. No. Now I'm sure going to say the Allah Most High bless you. The aura is different between the Hanafi and the Shafi here. You reminded me, Allah Most High bless you, of the issue of it's the same ruling with what they call a fasiqa who is Muslima, yeah. uh, you know, an immoral, essentially, Muslim woman. But as yeah. you have described, the, the point, the purpose here is, the issue here is that she, this is a Muslim woman who might see her aura and then describe her to men. She doesn't have that religious uh, education or even observance to prevent her from doing such things. So now, so although the details of exactly what is aura and what's not in this circumstance, it's slightly different between the two madhabs. That point is the same. That this is in the presence of non-Muslim women and also in in front of fasiqat, any Muslim women who may describe her. Shukran Sayyidi. We'll move on to the next question. This one I'm going to throw over to you, Sheikh Nuruddin, because uh, it's about the UK. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> brother asks: Most Sunni scholars did Eid Monday in the UK. It has been said that the onus is on them to explain, indicating it isn't valid by local global citing, but they are the majority, and isn't the majority normally right? <laughs> so basically, since yeah. the majority did it on Monday, doesn't that make the majority right? Yeah, okay, there's quite a lot to unpack there, but yes, generally speaking, the majority... Um, are considered to be upon guidance. 
Um, and the Prophet وسلم, encouraged us to follow the majority. Okay, But that doesn't mean the majority in a particular uh, time necessarily or in a particular given place. What the majority, when it comes to fiqh, what the majority are agreed upon and have been agreed upon for centuries is we have four methods in fiqh and you have to follow one of those four methods on any given legal issue. Okay, If you find in a particular place a majority who's that's veered away from that, be it in the UK or be it in the US or wherever it may be, you, you cannot say that that is the right position. Okay. Also, I would, um, you know, to say that majority done it on Monday, they need to explain why they done it on Monday. Okay, Because the people who done it on Monday in the UK, their explanation might be different to the people who done it on Monday in uh, in Algeria, for example, if they did indeed do it on Monday. Okay. Um, and especially, and we'll hand over to Sheikh Jumili, I think we'll probably have another question for Sheikh Jumili on local sighting, um, to explain local sighting. When, when you follow local sighting, doing Eid on Monday could be valid in one place and invalid in another place, or doing it on uh, Tuesday, or doing it on Sunday. The point is, when you're following local sighting, you can have different days in different places and they can be right. And it can also be wrong if it's not done correctly. So um, it's really conflating the issue when it's presented like this. When we're speaking about fiqh, let's be very, very clear. The majority say the following. We have four madhabs in fiqh. You have to follow one of these four madhabs on any given issue. Any person who moves away from that to something different and something new and says, well, I'm with the majority, I'm afraid you are not with the majority. You can claim it as loudly and as repeatedly as you like, you are not with the majority. The majority are with the four madhabs. Now, uh, it's also, uh, you know, inshallah we'll speak about this maybe in the context of other questions as well. It's also important to realize the role of contemporary scholars. The role of contemporary scholars has been massively misunderstood by many, many people. And sadly, it's been misunderstood by people who, who ought to know better, people who, who are supposed to be learned or are, have sheikh before their name or mufti before their name. The role of contemporary scholars is to relay, unless it's a completely new issue, Okay, is to relay what, cont uh, what classical scholars said. So in any case, uh, I'm sorry, I had to unpack a little bit, but the point is here, any person who performed Eid on Monday needs to explain why. If they say we done it because of local sighting, I'm going to hand over to Sheikh Muhammad Jamili because local sighting is a Shafi position. It's detailed out in the Shafi'i Madhab. In the Hanafi Madhab, it's mentioned as a position, but it's not the sound position in our Madhab. And what normally happens when something is not the sound opinion, you don't have sufficient detail regarding it. And any legal issue, you need the detail. You can't just say, I'm following this, and then you don't know anything about it. You need the detail. So in any case, Eid on Monday, Eid on Sunday, Eid on Tuesday, it's not good enough to say the majority done it or the minority done it. That's probably untrue anyway. I'm not saying, strictly speaking, Monday is untrue, but the reasoning behind it may be untrue. So if a person says, I didn't eat on Monday based on the Hanafi method, I will discuss with this person. I will say on what basis. If this person says, well, the Hanafi position is local citing, I was following local citing, I'll say, first of all, no. For the beginning of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan, the Hanafi position is global sighting. This is very, very clear in our madhab. Local sighting is mentioned, but it's not the sound opinion. If somebody were to say, I done it based on local sighting, I will say, speak to a Shafi'i scholar, speak to the likes of Sheikh Muhammad Jamili, other reliable Shafi'i scholars, and ask them, was what we done valid based on local sighting? And if it is, Bismillah. And if it's not, then I'm sorry, neither have you followed Hanafi, nor have you followed Shafi. Then you tell me which math have you followed. And it's no good saying I followed this group of scholars or this masjid or this institution. I'm sorry, that's no good. If you're going to in, in, engage in uh, fiqhi discourse, religious discourse, 
then you have to use the resources, you have to use the sources, you have to use the authorities. If you're going to engage in a discussion which is more cultural, that's a, an entirely different discussion. If you want to tackle it, uh, you know, along the lines of, well, we don't know what we're doing, so we just follow our masjid, okay, and you want to discuss it on that basis, not from an academic, ilmi perspective, then that's an entirely dis different discussion for us to have. Now, Saeed. Well, Zakhla, that's a very deep answer. Allah barik um, I think, to be honest, I just have one or two things. So the issue you've already touched on about majority. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu when he said, when he was speaking about that, la ummati ala khata, that the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu will not agree or come together upon a mis on an error. The scholars, uh, I haven't, I'm yet to see a scholar to say otherwise, but scholars, they say ummah here means the ulama. And ulama of a particular caliber, not just any ulama. Uh, nowadays, we use ulama very loosely. Loosely, sorry, it's loose. It's a term that's loosely used. And this was even uh, scholars like uh, from the Hanafi school, Ibn Abidin, rahimahullah, even mentioned that the term mufti was loosely used at his time. So uh, it's become a very loosely used term. And but scholars, you have to, we have to understand when we talk about majority, someone like me is not considered even if there are th billions of me will not make a majority um it's about the scholars and the majority of the scholars of the uh, that are off that are uh, authorities that have been considered authorities in fiqh or in that particular science those are called a majority if they all agree upon something this is a majority but if you have and let's assume these numbers of scholars are 10 of them. Let's just assume um, they're not, but let's assume they're 10. And you've got the whole of the Muslim world against them. It doesn't matter because those 10 are the authorities. The other rest of the people, it doesn't matter what their opinions are because they're not authorities in what they're talking about. So that's one thing that it's important to mention. Again, just to reiterate what Sheikh Noor is mentioning about this local and global. Um, although I'm not in the UK, but I did get experience of the uh, people saying they're following local sighting. And then when they ask me about it, that am I doing it right? And I'm asking, well, you firstly, the question I would like to ask someone who's doing that is if you're not sure what you're doing, why are you doing it in the first place? Uh, I understand there may be some fam family or cultural uh, consequences regarding these things. But uh, this is also a principle in the schools of fiqh that if there's an opinion, and you don't know the details about it, as Sheikh Noor mentioned, you're not allowed to follow that opinion. This is, uh, Sheikh Noor mentioned from the Hanafi, this is the same in the Shafi'i. Sometimes there are many situations where we might find an opinion in our school, which is why we can't follow opinions of uh, some of the earlier ulama, like Sufyan al-Thawri and these great scholars, because they might mention something, but the details surrounding that opinion we don't know of, or it hasn't been narrated to us, so therefore we can't follow those opinions. And this is a major problem. So local sighting, and I've, we've gone into a lot of detail, but it's very important to understand that a local sighting in the Shafi'i school, there are details with regards to that. Local does not mean your city, does not mean your village, it does not mean your country, it does not mean your continent. It has a complete different definition in the Shafi'i school. And this is why I perhaps don't like using local, because the local that... We understand when we say the term local, what we understand is something, but it's more of a regional type of area. Um, and there is a, 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 some detail with regards to that. I don't want to go into too much detail about this because, in reality, if someone wants to follow this, they really, really need to understand uh, it. And I think we've already done an answer on this before as yeah. well with Sheikh Noor. And we did a, uh, a video about this as well. So someone can refer to them uh, regarding that. No, I'm Sheikh, uh, we've had a question previously. Uh, it's on the same vein, Sheikh. So maybe, uh, Sheikh Jamili, you can comment on it. Is that uh, yeah. can Morocco be looked at for local sighting? No. <laughs> okay. I know I said that very quickly, but no. Morocco is not a local. Uh, depending on where you are, if you're in Morocco, then yes. Okay. And yeah. depending on where you want. Let me give an example. I live in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Riyadh is also Saudi Arabia. Riyadh is not local sighting for me in Jeddah. So if they see the moon in Riyadh and I don't see it in Jeddah or in Medina, it's not a local sighting for me. Even though I'm in the same country, even though I'm under the same ruler. So the same thing applies here. Morocco for the UK is not considered to be local sighted. No.
Is that, is that, Sheikh, you what me? about when they say that um, it might be difficult to? Yes, Sheikh. Uh, I was saying, what about when they say that it might be difficult to cite the moon in the UK, uh, and therefore we need to look at the closest Muslim country? No, because this is now applying. This closest Muslim country is where have they where have they got this principle from? Again, we have to understand that we can't just apply rules from our own understandings. There are rules and protocols. If you can't follow local citing, then you've got a few choices. You can either, if you're a Shafi'i, you, you have a, a, someone who's an expert in astronomy, who's trustworthy what they do, you can use calculations. Better, better still, rather than going to that, if you have a, a mixed community of Shafi'i, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, whatever, maybe better to go with global citing. Even that's a valid position in our school as well. So there's no limitation, especially with... The, with the situation we're in, we're not under one particular ruler. In the UK, you are a community. And that's where you have to understand your community better. But uh, most importantly is if you cannot apply local citing because you, it's too complicated or too difficult or no one knows the ins and outs, then go with the global citing. But follow either or follow with them properly. Jazakallah khair. We'll move on to the next question. Um, <clears throat> let me just bring it up. It says, when I'm praying Sunnah in, I assume that's Saudi Arabia, someone taps my shoulder often and expects me to become his Imam. The same can happen when I'm a follower and the latecomer joins after the Imam has finished. What to do? For both of us, Saidi. Uh, it's not really addressed to anyone, so perhaps we'll both answer it, inshallah. Both yeah, so from the Hanafi perspective, if first of all, the general rule is Sunnah and Nafil is not prayed in Jama'at, you have few exceptions, but that's the general rule. Tarawih is an exception, solar eclipse is an exception, but that's the general rule. Okay, so if it's you know, you're praying Sunnah or Nafil, and somebody wants to do it, join your Sunnah and your Nafil, you just carry on because there's no Jama'at for that. This is in the Hanafi man. Um, secondly, if you're praying Sunnah and this person wants to pray Fard with your Sunnah, then in the Hanafi, this is not allowed. So again, you just carry on praying. If you are praying the current Fard prayer and this person joins you, and this person should only join you if he's completely sure that you're praying the current Fard prayer and he's joining you in the current Fard prayer, and then he taps you to join you, then yes, you should assume the role of Imam, and you should pray as an Imam prays. Now, say in the Shafi'i school, uh, it's fine. Uh, contrary to <coughs> where we differ with the Hanafi, uh, is that you can pray a fard behind a nafil, a nafil behind the fard, uh, sunnah behind the whatever, whatever form of nafil it is, it can be done. Uh, some exceptions are there as uh, that where the form of the prayer is different so for instance if someone's praying the lunar or solar eclipse prayer in its proper form where you have in one one uh, in one rakah you have two rukus and two qiyams you cannot pray uh, that behind someone who's praying a normal prayer for instance you can't do that but otherwise you can pray a fard behind the sunnah and sunnah behind the fard so if this is a person who's asking is a shafi'i then you can become the imam uh, regardless of what prayer you're praying it's not a problem JazakAllah khair. Um, another question we have is, I think this is for Hanafi bit. I understand that is Mukhru to fast and brush teeth with toothpaste in the Hanafi madhab. Is this Mukhru Zahrimi or Tanzihi? And does this apply for fasting outside Ramadan too? Yes, uh, this, according to Ibn Abdin, rahimahullah ta'ala, is Tanzihi. He considered, generally speaking, he considered the Makruhat in Siyam uh, to be Tanzihiya. So this is Makru Tanzihi, best avoided. Um, but there's a, a, another factor here, which is just simply tasting something. Ibn Abdin didn't speak about brushing your teeth with toothpaste. Ibn Abdin spoke about tasting something. That's what the books of Fiqh speak about. And that's an immediate issue with using toothpaste. You're, you're tasting something. So uh, it's immediately Makru Tanzihi. But then on top of that, you have the concern of jeopardizing the validity of your fast because you may swallow 
some of this toothpaste. So, you know, I would strongly, strongly discourage people from doing this when they are fasting. Rather, the, the right thing to do is thoroughly clean your mouth and thoroughly clean your teeth prior to the fast starting. And then during the fast, you can use siwak, inshallah ta'ala. That is the best thing to do, no doubt about it. So it's not, it is makrut and zihi, but there, there is another factor here that needs to be considered as well, which is the, jeopard, uh, the jeopardizing of your fast. Does it apply to fast outside of Ramadan too? Yes, this applies to fasting generally. So, so that's all the questions from the comments for now. Uh, we did have a question in for you, Sheikh Jamili, specifically, because it was asking if uh, women are allowed to travel without a mahram for hajj, and if there's any evidence for that. Okay, so in the Shafi'i Madhab, um, if this is the Fard Hajj, meaning it's the uh, she's never performed Hajj before, and this is her obligatory Hajj, and this also not only for Hajj, it's also for obligatory Umrah. Okay, uh, in the Shafi'i Madhab, it's an obligation to do Umrah and Hajj once in their lifetime. Okay, um, as a Fard Al Ain, as an individual obligation. If it's a Fard Hajj or a Fard Umrah, then a woman is allowed to travel without a mahram. Uh, either the strongest opinion is that she has to have what we call women who are trustworthy and upright. Uh, and it must become three of them together. <coughs> Her and another two alike. Uh, she may travel with them. And another stronger, another opinion in our mother, which is also a strong opinion, is she may even travel alone so long as uh, there is no fitna for her. There's no fear of fitna. Some people misunderstand what this means. Fear, when we say fear here, it means that it's something that is not rare to occur. It's not rare. R what's not rare to occur? Fitna. Fitna meaning to bring attention. Or there's. it's not rare for people to approach or a man to... By approach, I don't mean literally for them to do something. No, the mere approaching of men towards her or the mere attraction of men towards her in any form like that if there's any fear of that then uh then she wouldn't be obliged to do hajj or umrah but if it's not fearful and it's it, this is secure it's a secure environment from her house all the way to the haram it's secure this is not there then hajj remains an obligation upon her and umrah and she may go even alone okay but if it's not secure in that way then it's not she's not obliged to do hajj or obliged to do umrah and this is something very important because sometimes one may feel that okay uh, it's an obligation no the sharia has made it easy in the sense that if if these things parameters are not set it's not an obligation for you to do hajj nor umrah and uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pardon you in the case of that but if it is secure then you may the woman may even travel alone uh, but i would always say it's always better of her to, to have people around and if better always make sure to have her mahram with her as well if possible no i'm saying so that's for the fard hajj and the fard yes. umrah is it is there any valid opinion in the shafi method that might expand it to other actions fard ain knowledge tarbiyah yes. anything yeah. else any sound opinions yeah this this is not only for hajj and umrah it applies to any obligation uh, and this, so this even includes uh, knowledge uh, for purposes of not for fard, fard knowledge. That is an obligation upon her. Um, anything that is not an obligation, then the Shafi'i Madhab does not allow that. So yeah, anything that's an obligation is permitted. Uh, but it's very important for her to bear in mind that if she's married, she needs her permission of her husband as well for, for any of those things. So the moment, even though she she can go to hajj umrah or whatever and the obligation of studying but if her husband doesn't it doesn't uh is not happy with that then she cannot go no so if uh, a lady were to say that look i'm going to uh you know another country let's say somewhere in the middle east for the purpose of uh tarbiyah spiritual education and rectitude um and i'm going to take this rukhsa from the shafi'i madhab especially in, a, 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 in the contemporary context, would you say this is applicable or not applicable, bearing in mind the various means of communication we have and uh, other means that are available? Yeah, Allah, I mean, Sayyidi, I'm from, from something that I spoke about with one of our teachers, Sheikh Salim al-Khatib, Hafizahullah, 
this is a question that we have, I posed it to him, and uh, he he was he said that even though that these uh, forms of communication are open, the issue of spirituality for a man and woman requires some form of relation with uh, or connection with the sh with that person, and being even around the right company in the places can help. So. Yani, if a person is coming out of an environment, going to another environment, whereby that environment is a lot more conducive to spiritual spirituality, etc., then this may be uh, fall under that category. Uh, especially if someone's not in the best environments and they're going to an environment where it's much more peaceful, it's a lot more it's people are praying their salah, they're going five times a day. It's that type of environment, then yes. But if it's not like that, then yani, again, because Purifying the heart is an obligation, and there's many ways of doing that. Uh, but if this is if this is seen as a particular way, then yes. I mean, our teacher said that Sheikh Salim. He seems to say he said that it is a way, and it can be an obligation. But it's something important that you've highlighted there, Sadie, is that someone must be genuine in what they're doing, and it's not an idea of okay, I'm going to take this rukhsa because it's there. Okay, the rukhsa is there, but uh, are you taking it? On what for what basis is it really because of that, or is it just for the sake of traveling or whatever it is? So, yeah. one needs to be quite genuine with their intentions, and Allah will reward according and Allah will reward according to those intentions. Allah yeah. Alhamdulillah. So, the point is that there is something there, but maybe the specific circumstances need to be checked, um, yes, with a Shafi scholar and say, Look, these are my circumstances, this is what I'm looking to do. What do you think? Is it Absolutely. permissible? So, Alhamdulillah, the point is there is something there, mashallah, but there are some details that need to be checked. No. No, I'm uh, Another question we had um, is in the chat, so we'll bring that up, and I guess similar in nature is that um, as a Muslim living in the UK with all that is going on around us, when is it compulsory upon us to make hijrah? I'd just like to, before you answer, uh, Sheikh Jamili did do a podcast with us. Uh, where he did go into some detail about this issue, which I yes, really I recommend everyone to listen to, and I'll put a link in the description. Sorry, in the chat. Yeah, I think it's better for Sheikh Jamili to address this early initially. Maybe I'll comment on it afterwards, but <laughs> far more experience in this field, mashallah. Well, no, um, <laughs> the question here says, when is it compulsory? <laughs> mm. uh, with all that's going on around us as well, that's an, that's something that I've, I haven't. I, I come to the UK every so often, but I haven't been there for a couple of years now, so I'm not. I'm not sure. With I have, I'm aware of things that may be happening, but the reality of the situation is, and talk from a fiqh perspective. Firstly, is that the the in the Shafi'i madhab, a person is not obliged to make hijrah to to leave a land um, unless their their life. Their wealth, their honor, which means family, children, and all their religion are at risk, a fear. And when we say religion, any part of the obligations of religion or uh, um, abstaining from any of the prohibitions. The moment any of these two are at risk, then the person is obliged to leave. Uh, find, firstly, find the means to avoid that if that can be resolved where you are then that's better because you are uh, you are enjoying good and forbidding evil uh, if you can do that um, if you cannot do that and the only means is for you to get up and leave that's the only way then that must be taken and this applies to non-muslim lands as for muslim lands uh, you, no one's allowed to leave those lands uh, i'm not going to go into too much detail but you're not allowed to leave those lands and if there's a problem such as, for example, I don't want to go into politics or anything like that, but if you have a Muslim land and, you know, there's some invasion by non-Muslim or whatever, a Muslim is not allowed to leave their lands, even if that means their life will have to be at risk for that. Okay? As for non-Muslim lands, then those principles apply. Um, as for what is going on around you, Annie, again, I think a person needs to genuinely assess what's around them again moving as well is not a very easy thing in our it's easier but it's not easy as well it requires some work it requires some uh thinking about things this is a practically you know there's visas restrictions 
um, and a person needs to also take these things into account. But um, if the person uh, has a sincere intention and sincerely is concerned for aspects of their religion that they cannot seem to uh, find resolve in wherever they are, then uh, they must have confidence in Allah and take those steps necessary. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide relief and support for those that traverse in his path. Wallahu alam. Mm -hmm. um, I would essentially second that, Yeni. Uh, the, the, the basic fit principle is similar. Uh, if you're living here uh, in non-Muslim lands and you feel that you cannot avoid prohibitions, you cannot fulfill your obligations, or there's a threat to the um, strength or even existence of Iman for yourself or your family, then of course you must leave. You must do whatever you can to preserve your Iman. Forget, you know, moving from one country, uh, from a non-Muslim country to a, a Muslim country. If you need to move 50 or 100 times to preserve your Iman, you, you do it. There's nothing as precious as Iman. Okay, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's all about um, upholding your deen. Iman and also the legal rulings. Legal rulings are very, very important. And if you find yourself in a situation that you can't do that, then yes, you must migrate. If you find that you can do that, then khair, inshallah ta'ala. But if you stay here, remain strong and firm and confident and strong on your deen. One of the more infuriating aspects of what um, some Muslims do here in the West, and I was involved in this um, Recently, because I, I, I made a video about mortgage being prohibited, okay, uh, they don't understand things in context. On the one hand, they say we can stay in this land because we can fulfill our obligations and we can stay away from haram. Okay? On the other hand, they say, well, no, we should allow mortgages because it's very difficult without. Well, then obviously you can't stay in this land without engaging in haram. Okay. And you say, OK, this should be allowed because of the difficulties of, of this place. So we, we can't avoid this haram and you can't avoid this haram. Therefore, it's all allowed. No. Now you're making an argument for hijrah. If you're saying we can't live in this land without in, without taking a mortgage, migrate. Oh, it's difficult. Yes, it, it is difficult. Hijrah is um, very highly praised in the Quran and the Sunnah to the extent when the Sahaba used to speak about each other and the ranks of different Sahaba, one of the uh, criteria they would use is Hijrah. They would say, Fulan made both of the Hijras. Such and such made both of the Hijras. Hijrah is a big thing. It's a, a great act of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all with sincerity in, uh, in whichever act of devotion they offer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's a big thing. It's difficult. Of course it is. But when you start saying, oh, we're living here, therefore the, this, the fatwa should make this halal as well, and this haram should be made halal as well, and these scholars gave this fatwa, making this halal, and these scholars gave this fatwa. And some scholars, or so-called scholars, have gone to such an extent, there's an entirely new legal system for minorities living in non-Muslim lands. Say that we have fiqh laqalliyat, we have minority fiqh, there's a different fiqh, there's a different legal system. SubhanAllah, where'd you get that from? If you need a different fiqh, then you're living in the wrong place. Go migrate. It will be asked regarding this. Wasn't the land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vast enough? You can't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. Move. Find it difficult there, move again. Find it difficult there, move again. Okay. Find it difficult, that move again. Yes, there are contexts, as Sheikh uh, Muhammad pointed out, that you know there are certain situations where you have to stand and defend because you're defending uh, you, your deen, you're defending your fellow Muslim, you're defending your land. Yeah, but those are different contexts. But we're speaking about where it's just simply a matter of we can't practice our deen properly here. Okay, move, move again, move again, move again. There's nothing as important as your relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You give up what you need to. The truth and the reality is. We don't want to bring things together. We want to do what we like, we want to fulfill our desires, and we want to make isolated religious arguments. Bring it together and you'll see you're not making any sense. So on the one hand, you say it's too difficult, we need to take mortgages. 
On the other hand, you say we are allowed to stay in non-Muslim lands because we can practice our religion. You're contradicting yourself. Now I'm saying. <coughs> Jazakallah khair. Um, I think that's all we have time for. So we'll... actually, Sheikh, we did have one question in the comments before. I don't know if you want to address that, Sheikh Anuruddin. Uh, yeah, it's a true. bit of a discussion yeah. we've been having with with a brother uh, yeah. about um, global moon sighting, uh, uh, and the brother said um, he quoted an <laughs> ayah of the Quran. It was um, Surah Yunus, uh, verse five, which where it, um, Allah says, "He's the one who made the sun a radiant source and the moon a reflected light, with precisely ordained phases, so that you may know the number of years and calculation of time." Allah did not create all this except for a purpose. He makes the signs clear for people of knowledge. And the brothers arguing that um, from this understanding, uh, if the Ummat Ummi hadith goes against the Quran here, so basically he's saying that, you know, where the Prophet said that we are unlettered Ummah, we don't follow calculations, um, this hadith seems to be going against. Uh, Allah clearly stating that the moon is there so you may know the hisab so that you may know the calculations no, 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 no. So you may know the calculations no 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 what well, this is what he said he says um i quote can you read his translation of the ayah again Sayyidi? the translation well, I, of the ayah the source again please the the number it's uh I, surah you know sorry yes Surah Yunus, Ayah 5, and uh, do you want me to read out the whole whole translation? Uh, yeah, read out his translation again, Sadie. Okay, the translation is, He is the one who made the sun a radiant source and the moon a reflected light with precisely ordained phases so that you may know the numbers of years and calculation brackets of time. Hisab is not calculations. This is how, um, let's say, Must Dr. Mustafa yeah, Khatib has translated it. Uh, Sahih International translates it as account, uh, that you may know the number of years and account. Um, but anyway, the, the brother is trying to argue that this goes against the hadith. Maybe you can comment on that. No, anything else he said? Uh, actually, let, let Sheikh Shamili make his comment and then uh, I'll comment on the whole thing. Father, say this is for you, Sayyidina. You know, it's just that the term Adad as Sinina wal Hisab, Yani Hisab Adad as Sinina to know the uh, the number of years and Hisab. Hisab does not mean calculations, it doesn't imply calculations at all. Hisab, what immediately comes out with Hisab, the immediate understanding from Hisab without looking at the Tafasir, the immediate understanding from that is counting months. To know the and years and months. Okay, so this makes sense because it goes sinin wal hisab. Because years and months come together. This is just coming from it. But hisab, to say calculations, yani, this is, uh, the, the, yani, uh, for me, it's not, the, this. there is no contradiction between the hadith and this That's ayah. Okay. Yani, at all, at all, at all. Because <laughs> in fact, in fact, this is, this is more evidence to support what the Hanafis are probably say, are going to tell you now, inshallah. Yeah. I, sorry, I, I, I don't want to misquote the brother. He, he did yeah. then say, um, he said, whilst calculations is not used to determine the month, this ayah of the Quran clearly demonstrates that astronomical knowledge can be used to ensure sighting is accurate. Okay. Anything else he said, Sadie? Let's get. He all also of said uh, <laughs> he was basically also saying that we, the, you know the ulama have written extensively on this topic, and you know we should yes, follow the have. fatwa, um, and we should follow the, the fatwa of the modern modern ulama, uh, and that, that he's saying that the Hanifi madhab, uh, you know, there are a lot of ulama that follow the local sighting, and I assume he's trying to make the point that it is a sound opinion in the Hanifi madhab. Okay, there's quite a lot there. I, I'm going to speak. Uh, Sheikh Yamin, I'll give you a chance at the end as well if you well, want to raise any issues. But <laughs> there's quite a lot there. First of all, as I said at the beginning, any person in the context of fiqh who wants to provide an interpretation of hadith, of the Holy Quran, or of hadith, we say, fine, we're not interested in your interpretation or your Sheikh's interpretation or your Sheikh's friend's interpretation. We're not interested. 
We have a methodology as Sunni Muslims. We have a tradition. Okay. What I'm interested in is not his, this brother's interpretation or his sheikh's interpretation or Mufti Fulan or Mufti Fulan. Show me, if you're speaking from the Hanafi perspective, show me from the books of the Hanafi method. That's what I'm interested in. Okay, say so if, if uh, it, the brother also spoke about local sighting that wants to follow local sighting, should follow local sighting, say fine, follow local sighting. I respect local sighting a great deal to the extent I have repeatedly said, and I will say again, if everybody here in the UK decides to follow local sighting correctly, as per the Shafi method, I will follow it because the Shafi method is absolutely valid and it's very, very highly regarded. It says, is equal to the Hanafi and the Shafi and, and, and the Maliki and the Hanbali, mashallah. Okay? Um, but follow it correctly, and I will follow it. I've got no issue. Okay? What I've got an issue with is misrepresentation and conflicting things. No. Um, so, just uh, that's the point. If he says we want to follow local, follow local. Tell people clearly, this is opinion in the Shafi method. We're going to follow it and tell them these are the details. We have them from Shafi scholars. They are found in Shafi books. We're going to follow them. This month. Now, if the argument is going to be made that this ayah, um, let, let's let's be generous. Let's say what he's saying is that this ayah doesn't necessarily negate the hadith. I mean, the hadith is to be rejected absolutely, which is, uh, you know, something maybe I'll come back to in a moment. But if he's saying that this ayah means that we need to reinterpret the hadith, first of all, show us the, the new interpretation of the hadith. Okay, and show us why there's a, a contradiction. Also, so, sorry, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, I may have misunderstood what he wrote. Let me repeat what he said because I don't want to misrepresent yeah. the brother. He said this understanding, and I assume what he meant by this is actually your understanding, Sheikh yeah. Sheikh Nuruddin. He's saying basically your understanding of Ummat and Ummi, i.e., the unlettered Ummah hadith, your understanding of that hadith goes against. The Quran, i.e., the verse we, we just spoke about, where, where he says, where Allah clearly states that the moon is there so that you may know the hisab. So he goes, while you're, you're free to your opinion, the ulama have written extensively on this topic, demonstrating that whilst calculations is not used to determine the month, this ayah of the Quran clearly demonstrates that astronomical knowledge can be used for citing accurately. Okay. Now, again, I'll say, I'll repeat the same thing. I'm not interested in my opinion. And I'll say to the brother, I'm not interested in your opinion, no, in your sheikh's opinion. Okay. I'm interested because we're speaking about Hanafi. I'm speaking about what the Hanafi scholars said. And in my answer, we'll put that up in the, in the, in, in the, in the comments, inshallah ta'ala. In the answer I provided on the website and the videos I, I had recorded on this, I provided references from not contemporary, not recent, classical agreed upon scholars of the Hanafi method. Now, if somebody believes that I've misrepresented that, no problem. Don't tell me Mufti Fulan and Mufti Fulan and Sheikh Fulan and Sheikh Fulan. Tell me which agreed upon classical scholars of the Hanafi method said that is wrong and this is right. And that's it. We have a methodology. My understanding can be wrong, his understanding can be wrong, his sheikh's understanding can be wrong. It's all going to be put up against the manhaj that we have, the methodology that we have. Okay, let's put it up against. For me to quote classical scholars of the Hanafi madhab and for him to come back with what sheikh this said this and sheikh said this wrote extensively on it, it's meaningless. That is meaningless. And this is one of the reasons that we end up with such sectarianism in modern times. Because people don't want to go back to that which is agreed upon. In every field of the Islamic sciences, you have um, pillars. You have uh, agreed upon sources. When you go back to those, you can unite. When everybody says my group of sheikhs is saying this or this team of sheikhs is saying this and this sheikh wrote about it extensively, then you have nothing that you can agree upon. And it's against the manhaj of Ahl al-Sunnah. Okay? So if the brother or anybody he knows believes that this hadith has been misinterpreted and the hadith taken literally contradicts the ayah of the Holy Quran, I will say that's your understanding Show me from the classical scholars of Islam. I have not seen any of the classical Hanafi scholars, sorry, the classical Hanafi scholars. I haven't seen any of them look at this hadith 
and then look uh, and say it, 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 we can't accept this hadith or we can't take it literally because it contradicts this verse of the Holy Quran. Absolutely not. They didn't do that, and they will do that. If they feel there's an issue, they do that. that when you read the books of fiqh, you constantly come across this. They say, we'll have to interpret this hadith because of this verse of the Holy Quran. We'll have to interpret this verse of the Holy Quran because of this verse of the Holy Quran. We'll have to look at this hadith in light of this, so we can't take it literally. They didn't say that, and that's the point. The, the, the problem here is people have taken, and I've said this repeatedly, people have taken very strong positions regarding the moon sighting issue without thoroughly researching it. And then they come across things that you cannot turn away from. You cannot turn away from Sahih Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They come across that and they don't, don't, don't know what to do. Well, I'll tell them what to do and I'll tell me what to do. Forget our egos. Forget the mistakes that we've made. Just follow the haq and follow the truth. Okay. And... The haqq and the truth is this is an authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the interpretation of the Hanafi madhab. Now, other madhahib might have slightly different interpretations. Other madhabs might have more room for calculations. That's fine. Quote from those madhahib and make it clear, make it very transparent and say, here, this madhab understood this hadith in this way. So we're going with that. This madhab understood it in this way. But don't play games. Let's not play my sheikh is bigger than your sheikh. Okay? Let's not play, you know, Fulan said this and Fulan said this. Let's stick to the authorities. When it comes to fiqh, the authorities are the four madhabs. And the scholars that are um, authoritative in these four madhabs are well known. And the scholars that are agreed upon in these four madhabs are well known. Stick to those sources and we can come to some kind of agreement. Now, Sayyidi, did I answer all of the points he raised in his objection? Sayyidi Waqqas? I believe so, Sheikh. Um, no. I mean, there was another one as well. I don't know if you have time right now, but... but let's just quickly address it, and I want to hand over to Sheikh uh, Muhammad, and then we'll close. Okay, Sheikh. Uh, I mean, he uh, another question he had, and he said, you know, you, you haven't answered it yet. Uh, it was to do with... Uh, <laughs> let me just bring it up. Sorry, Sheikh. Um uh, his question was that, um, sorry, where is it gone? Okay, he, this is an analogy he gives. It goes, if 12 months of the year in Afghanistan, someone said they sighted the moon, you would have 12 months of 29 days. So this goes against the hadith, which tells us a month is either 29 or 30. What would you do in this situation? You have no safeguard for it. Since you rejected knowledge of the eclipse and since you will end up with a 29 month every month, this is wrong. Yeah, Sheikh. Yeah, I don't fully understand his point. <laughs> um, yeah, if the Prophet Sallallahu said a month can be 29 days, a month can be 30 days. Okay? We follow the rules established in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu as explained by the Fuqaha. And when those, deter those rules determine that a day is 29 days, it's 29 days. And when they determine the day is 30 days, it's 30 days. If, th if those rules... Follow, determine a day is 30, a month, sorry, is 31 days or a month is 28 days, then we have a problem. We don't have a problem if the, the rules are applied and it tells us this month was 29 and then this month was 29 as well and then this month was 29 as well. The rules are followed. Okay. And again, we're getting into um, unlikely hypotheticals. Okay? And we can go on and on about unlikely hypotheticals. Let's stick to the situation where we're in. The situation we are in, we have a valid moon sighting as per the criteria in the Hanafi method. If you're following global sighting, you follow it. If you're following local sighting, follow local sighting correctly. Now, Fadl Sayyidi, Sheikh Muhammad. No, no, I think, uh, I think there's just, uh, from the questioner, there seems to be some confusion with regards to many things. Um, uh, firstly, I'm talking from a Shafi'i, obviously, from as a Shafi'i, we do allow calculations, but we never have used this ayah or anything similar to argue against the Hanafis. That's something just to bear that in mind. Yeah. That hadith about the Prophet said, Nahna ummatun ummiyya, is used very extensively across fiqh. It's not only here. Even as Shafi'is, we use that. Because although we, in this particular scenario, in moon sighting, we've allowed calculations quite accurately, but for Salah, we don't allow it. We don't allow it, nor for eclipses. 
and you, you might see there might someone said there's an eclipse, but it's it, it's there's clouds. We can't see it. You don't pray the eclipse prayer, even though you can see it on television. Okay. Now someone might say, but well, that's a little bit strange. No, it's not strange because these are rules. This is how Allah and the Prophet ﷺ has made it for us. Now, when it comes to a situation where the questioner was asking, what if we have it for like in Afghanistan every year month is 29 days? So you're going to end up missing it. You no, know, you'll catch it. You'll that 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 most likely won't happen because and even if it does, it's mentioned in the books of fiqh. Sometimes what may happen is they'll go through a month. And then they'll think that they've seen the moon or they haven't seen the moon, whatever it is. They've done 29 days. The next day they realize, hang on a minute, the moon doesn't look as it should have been. It's the first of it's the first now. So therefore we've made a or we've been we miscalculated. Okay, with our with our uh, naked eye sighting. That's fine. Just change it and go back to start from where you are now. It doesn't make a difference. It there's a the, the, what we have to be careful of, the time we live in today, there's this obsession about accuracy. There's a big obsession about accuracy. Everybody has to nail it on the head. The first of Ramadan, the first of Eid. As in, as if it's something that Allah has made and prayer time has to be on the dot. This is not what we've been... Uh, Allah has not put that burden on us to that level of accuracy at all. Which is why this issue of Nahnu Ummadun Ummiya is in place. And the only reason the Shafi'iyah have allowed moon sighting in calculations is only because of the words of the Prophet Sallallahu when he said um, when he said Ru'ya Sallallahu when he says fast when you see it okay our ulama have understood seeing as a form of knowledge i.e. not just seeing it uh, uh, fast when you know it that's how they interpreted it and break your fast when you know it yeah, and so they took the, this hadith allowed them to go back to knowledge, and the part of knowledge is calculation, which is why they allowed that. Okay, unlike other prayers, no, then they, they, for other chapters they were not like that. So the point I'm trying to say, and I'm trying to get back here, the Shafi'iyah, we haven't allowed calculations because they're so amazing and because they're so accurate. No, on the contrary, we're actually against it. Okay, because we don't use them. But we only use it for the situation where the hadith has permitted it, okay? And it does not go against the principles of the religion. So it's something I think the question, inshallah, that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and us with knowledge and make it easier for us to understand things in the way that it should be understood. As Sayyidi Sheikh Noor has mentioned, in the light of the four madhabs and in general for people out there, we need to get out of this obsession of accuracy. I'm not saying being accurate is, is, is not good or learning other things is not good. No, astronomy and these type of things are important aspects. But this, um, this accuracy that we're living in in our lives today, I've seen it with, with Eid and Ramadan. I've seen it with Hajj. Uh, and I've also seen it when, it, uh, when it comes now to prayers as well. There's a certain level of, I would call it OCD, Okay, obsessive compulsory disorder that we're suffering from, which the religion has not even asked us to do. And we don't even need to do it. In fact, it's told us not to do it. Okay, because it's overcomplicating matters. All right, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all I had to say, Sayyidi, over that. Jazakallah. Yeah. No, thank you for that, Sayyidi. Just, I, I did say I would hand over, but just one final comment, because what you've said reminded me of it. Yes, there are things within the fiqh that would rectify that kind of situation, because if... Um, for example, in the Hanafi Madhab, they say if it's completely clear um, and the, the, on the horizon there's no um, cloud whatsoever, and then you still have um, a problem with the moon sighting, then they will make an assumption that their initial sighting was incorrect. There are things within the fiqh that would rectify it. Now, but you know, ultimately, the point is... Um, if you are sufficiently knowledgeable, then Bismillah, discuss this issue. But if you are sufficiently knowledgeable, you will discuss it from the perspective of the four madhabs and you will, uh, you will discuss it from the perspective of the authorities within the four madhabs. When you are not sufficiently knowledgeable, my strong advice would be don't get involved in the argument. Nobody should be arguing anyway. 
But to be quite honest, don't even get involved in the discussion if you don't have sufficient knowledge, because you won't know, not just regarding this issue, regarding any aspect of the deen, you won't know when you are directly contradicting the Holy Quran, and you won't know when you're directly contradicting the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A last point I just remembered, because I, I did read some of those, well, a good number of those comments, I did read them. And one of them, or, or one of the people, or maybe it was more than one, kept saying, oh, this is making a mockery of the deen, this is making a mockery of the deen. And I'm going to end with speaking about this. Making, uh, it's not following the Mubarak hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and say, I don't care about astronomers, I'm going to follow the words of my blessed and Mubarak and beloved Prophet ﷺ. It's not making a mockery of the deen. It's Ainu deen. It's the essence of deen. We turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger above everything else. Okay? The hadith as far as the Hanafis are concerned is clear. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. Following that is hidayah, is guidance. It's not mockery. Mockery is when you look at clear verses of the Holy Quran, you look at clear hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, you turn away from that, you attack that, and you try to follow something completely different. Whether you find some scholars on your side or not, I'm not interested. What I'm interested in, as I've said before, if it's a fiqh issue, show me the authoritative classical scholars. Okay? As I've alluded to and Sheikh Jamili has clarified, the Shafis look at this hadith in a different manner. If you want to come to me and tell me the Shafis look at this hadith in a different manner and I'm going to follow that, I'll say Bismillah. Because that's part of the methodology of Ahl Sunnah. When you want to come to me and say that, no, this is wrong even from the Hanafi perspective and this contradicts this verse of the Holy Quran, I'll say, show me from the Hanafi perspective. Then. And if you can't, then please, don't speak without knowledge. Now, sir. Jazakallah, Khair, Sheikh. Wow, okay. um, we are out of time for this month. Inshallah, do join us next month. Uh, in the meantime, they, you can check out www.islamanswers.co.uk and uh, inshallah we'll see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.